بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بار الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيدي المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم محمد وعلى عائله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين المنتخبين المنتجبين الذين كلامهم نور وأمرهم رجت ووصيتهم التقوى وفعلهم الخير وعادتهم الإحسان وسجيتهم الكرم لا سيما على الحسين المذلوم المقتول المجروح العطشان المذبوح من القفاء في يوم عاشوراء في أرض كربلاء بلا جرم ولا خطأ الذي غسله دمه وكفنه رمال كربلاء مقطع العذاء مسلوب العمامة والرداء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر كيف ضرب الله مثلا كلمة طيبة كشجرة طيبة أصلها ثابت وفرؤها في السماء صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ibrahim mentions Alam tara kayfa dharab Allahu mathalan Kalimatan tayyibatan Kashajaratin tayyiba Have you not seen the example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents? For the example that Allah azza wa jal presents is the example of the pure speech or the pure kalima And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the kalima which is pure is like the tree that is pure. This verse, like other verses in Quran al Karim, was a center of discussion amongst Mufassirin. For firstly, Mufassirin came to see what is referred to by Kalima Tayyib. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Kalima which is pure, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to? And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives example and says that this Kalima Tun Tayyib is like the pure tree. What is meant by that pure tree? And was this a physical tree that existed? Or was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through imagery explaining to me and you one of the realities of this world? When I come to look at the tafsir of this verse of Surah Al-Ibrahim, some came and said what was meant by this pure kalima was the kalima of tawheed. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying the example of la ilaha illallah is like this tree. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes to describe this tree and he says asluha thabit wa far'uha fis sama. Others said no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he meant, meant by this kalima was Quranul Kareem. 
A third group of people came and said, Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salatu was salama, this kalima. But one of those tafasir, which I wish to focus on today, is that what is meant by kalima tayyib in this verse is the mu'min. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this tree and tells us about the four qualities of this tree, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling me and you four qualities of the believer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us what the believer should be like. And so I wish to analyze this verse in light of this tafsir that we have mentioned. Before I can do so, however, it's important for us to realize that when I say that this verse in question has a number of interpretations, normally when I interpret something, and I say these are the possibilities as to what is intended by this speech, by this sentence, by this paragraph, normally only one of them is intended. However, in Quranul Kareem, if I was to say there are four possibilities of what is meant by Kalima Tayyiba, the beauty of Quranul Kareem is that every single one of these could be what is intended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in the way that what is intended is Quranul Kareem, what is also intended is Ahlul Bayt. What is also intended is the Kalima of Tawheed and La ilaha illallah. If that has been understood, the first issue that needs to be dealt with is what is so special about this verse when it speaks and describes to us the quality of the mu'min. And in order to answer this question, so you understand what is the special quality of this verse of Surah Ibrahim, I mention an example. And this example isn't necessarily true. It's not that it took place. But from this we can understand what is the khususiyya and special quality of this verse. We're told there is a small town or village. This small town or village has heard of an animal by the name of an elephant, but they've never seen an elephant. They heard stories of the elephant. People describe to them different things about the elephant. They've never seen one. On one occasion, a person comes from this same town and village and he says, I have organized for us to see an elephant tomorrow. I'm bringing one to this town. But there's one issue that will take place. This is what? I can only bring this elephant to you in the evening or night time. And I only have this for a few hours. By the time the sun rises, that elephant will no longer be in this village. So should I still bring it? And we're assuming when this example took place, those that mentioned this example, is that as soon as it is night time, we can't see anything. There's complete darkness. So is there still a point for me to bring this Elephant, you won't be able to see it. They said, yes, there's still a point, bring it. So this person then goes, the next day he brings this elephant after the time of Maghrib, when there's complete darkness. And when he brings it, he places it in a room and people are given the chance to come and see this elephant. So there's a line and a queue that is formed. The first person enters, he can't see anything. And so what does he do if I can't see it? What would I do? I want to experience what it is. He goes and touches it. When this person touches one part of the elephant, he touches the trunk. He comes out, everyone is excited. You saw the animal, describe it to us. So he describes what he felt. He says the elephant is something uh, very long, similar to the trunk of a tree. So everyone has assumed that it looks like that. The second person goes in. When the second person goes in, that person method and felt the feet of the elephant. He comes out and describes what he saw, something which is very wide, methalan, had a lot of flesh. The third person comes and coincidentally, he felt the tail of this animal. So he comes and he describes what he saw, something very thin, something very long. When they bring all of their ideas together, they see everyone has seen a different animal. You describe that animal in one way and that person describes it in another way. So the person who had bought that elephant the day uh, uh, on that evening, he realizes what's happened. He says, you felt one part of the animal, someone else felt another. They described what they felt. When you bring all of these together, then you come to understand what that animal is. This is the example of us when it comes to many concepts of our religion. For I said this verse explains to us the qualities of a mu'min. Sometimes I've read a riwayah, a hadith. I heard that a mu'min is like this. I believed that all of the qualities of the mu'min are mentioned here. 
And the way that that person felt one part of the animal and believed all of the animal was this. Another person says the mu'min is described in this way. They thought that is tamamul haqiqa. That is the complete reality of the mu'min. When in actual fact, the imam, when he mentions that narration, is telling us about part of the mu'min, part of the character of the believer. And so what is interesting about this verse is that this verse brings many things together. And it doesn't just tell us about one part of the life of the believer. It gives us a holistic view of who the believer is and what the believing man or woman should be like. If that has been understood, my second question then is, is why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin with a question? But first recite the salawat. Allahumma salli ala. The second of your salawat for the love of Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. The third in honor of Sahib al Asri was Zaman. Allahumma salli ala. The second question then that comes therefore is why does this verse mention a question? What do I mean? You find often in Quranul Kareem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks to the human being, he speaks with a question. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A ilahun ma Allah. Is there another deity alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? A question posed to the human being. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fabi ayi ala irabbikuma. Which of the bounties of your Lord do you deny and reject? Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al feel. Haven't you seen the way in which your Lord dealt with the people of the elephant? Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hal yastawi alladheena ya'lamuna walladheena la ya'lamoon. Are those that know and those that don't know the same? Often in Quranul Kareem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this method of asking questions. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done the same thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara, have you not seen the example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned? Why? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala present a question to me in Quranul Kareem? Here we need to understand that questions have dawai mukhtalifa, different reasons behind the question. There are different goals behind me asking a question. For sometimes I ask a question because I don't know. I want to know a certain thing, I ask a question. However, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, naturally, Allah being the complete knowledgeable one, he doesn't ask a question because he doesn't know and because he wants the answer. Rather, the reason behind questions in Quran al Karim differ. Sometimes when I ask a question, my question is because I am angry and I want to warn someone. Like what? Like I, for example, have a flight to catch and I need to go to the airport. So I told someone be with me by 10 a.m. because I need to catch my flight. That person, instead of coming at 10, came at 11. He came one hour late. One of the ways that I can show that I'm upset with him and this is a warning is I'd ask them a question. What time did I tell you to arrive? Here I've asked a question. But is that question because I don't know? No. It's because I'm warning that person. Sometimes a question is asked out of mockery. I saw someone wear a certain item of clothing. And when I saw them, I said, is this what you're wearing? So I asked the question. I don't need to know. I know it's in front of me. But my goal is to mock that person. Likewise in Quranul Kareem, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks a question as a warning to the kafirin or the munafiqeen. Or sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks a question to make a mockery of the disbelievers. Sometimes Allah asks a question and then he doesn't answer it. When you read these verses, you should be aware of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing. He asks you a question, he doesn't answer it. Why? Because he's trying to tell you that your own fitrah and your own human nature can answer that question for you. Like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the verse that I have just quoted. Are those that know and those that don't know equal? He doesn't need to answer. Your own essence and wujud knows the answer. That the one with knowledge 
isn't like the one that is ignorant. And so these are some of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks a question in Quran al Karim. Why did he ask a question here? Alam tara kayfa dharab Allahu mathalan. Haven't you seen the example that Allah has given? And so here the scholars come and say that the reason he asks a question is simple. He asks the question in order to tell you this is something you should ponder upon. This is a reality that you should do fikr upon. Haven't you seen? I ponder upon what I'm saying right now. If these two preliminary questions have been understood, I said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an example. The life of a mu'min should be like this tree. And the verse mentions four qualities that I wish to go through very quickly for us to understand what our life should be like. The first quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions is asluha thabit. He says that this tree, the first quality of it is that its roots are firmly in the ground. What does this mean when it comes to the mu'min? That this tree is such that the strong winds that blow are unable to shake this tree. The tree is firmly rooted in the ground. Scholars came and said this is the first quality that a believer has. A believer's belief isn't swayed by what they see in front of them. For how many times do you see someone? Today he's walking in this valley. Tomorrow he's in the opposite valley. Today he's with these people. Tomorrow he's with the opposite. The believer is someone whose belief are thabit and do not sway. For when you look in the books of history, you find two examples of people. You find that person that swayed very easily. The wind moves this way, that person is on that direction. It moves in the opposite place, he's in that direction. And then you find that person which is like this tree, thabit. No matter what happens in front of them, their belief remains the same. So an example of the first, during the time of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, is a person by the name of Hassan ibn Thabit. Hassan ibn Thabit is a poet. Hassan ibn Thabit, why is he interesting? Because on the day of Ghadir, when Amir al-Mu'mineen is officially appointed as Mawla al-Mu'mineen, Hassan ibn Thabit is one of the first to come forward and recite poetry praising Amir al-Mu'mineen. You think, very good. This person is praising Amir al-Mu'mineen on the day of Wilaya. However, this same Hassan ibn Thabit, a few years later, when the Khilafah of the first Khalif is officially appointed, one of the first to recite poetry and praise of him is Hassan. One day he's on this side, the other day he's somewhere else. The mu'min is like the tree deeply rooted. Nothing causes that tree to move. The example of those, you'll find books of history filled. Of those, no matter what challenges they faced, their belief was firm. When you look in the history of those people that were representatives of the 12th Imam, Ajillahu ta'ala farjahu sharif in the minor occultation, ghaybatu al we know that there's four people that are direct representatives of the Imam in Ghaybat al Sughra. Uthman ibn Sa'id, Muhammad ibn Uthman, Hussein ibn Ruh, Ali ibn Muhammad Samari. If a person wants to contact the Imam, they go to one of these, they give that person a letter, that person takes the letter to the Imam, the Imam answers and he gives it to this representative. If I want to give money, for example, khums to the Imam, I give it through this representative. So the third of those representatives, and as we know, this idea of a direct representative finished with the minor occultation, the third of these is Hussein bin Ruh and Nawbakhti. Hussein bin Ruh and Nawbakhti is very interesting. If you read his life, you find a number of things that are very interesting and valuable for us to learn from in his life. Hussein bin Ruh and Nawbakhti, there's a reason why. He is chosen as the direct representative. For we're told this person lives in a time of great taqiyya. And often he has debates with others in regards to the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam. And often his life is in danger. That on one occasion he takes, uh, he has with him khums money to give to the imam. And he is caught by uh, the people of that time. They tell him, give us this money. And will set you free. 
He says, this money doesn't belong to me in the first place. How can I give it to you? And so because he's not willing to give them the mal of the imam, he's jailed for five years. The books of history and the scholars that speak about Mahdawiyah, they mention what was the quality that he had that made him a representative of the imam in Ghaybat al-Sughra. They said this one quality of what we call istiqama. They said Hussein ibn Raw has a statement. He says if the 12th imam, Ajlillahu ta'ala, Farajuhu sharif was behind my aba. So no one can see him, he's behind this aba of mine. And I'm asked, where is your imam? He says, I would allow myself to be cut into pieces, then just lift the aba to show people where he is. Because of this istiqam, that firm faith and belief, he is made a direct representative. And so the first quality was what? Asluha thabit. The second quality, far'uha fissama. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this tree, the branches of this tree reach the skies. What does this mean in regards to the mu'min? This refers to a number of realities that the mu'min should have if they wish to be a believer. Far'uha fissama. The branches reach the sky, number one. The goals that a believer has are always lofty goals. Whether that be in regards to issues of the dunya or issues of their religion. How many people do I find when you ask them, what are your aspirations in your life? Forget about religion right now. In the work that you do, in the study that you do, in your professional life, what are your aspirations? Very average. Mediocre. Their goals are very normal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the mu'min far'uha fis sama, the branches reach the sky. Meaning the goal of a believer, whether it be in regards to their dunya, that which they study, that which they work, they should have the highest of goals. We don't want people that are average and aim to be average. No, people that aim to be the best in what they do. And whether it be in regards to their religion and their deen. For when you ask people about their deen, where do you want to reach in your religion? What level do you want to reach? If I pray my salah, I'm happy. Why have you kept the bar so low? Why have you kept the bar so low? If I pray my salah and do this and that, I'm happy. Aim for the highest levels of spirituality. Aim to be one of the best believers. This was one meaning of far'uha fis sama. Another meaning. Another meaning of far'uha fis sama, the scholar said, the branches of this tree reach the skies, is that a mu'min and a believer is always in progression. Compared to last year, compared to a few months ago, I'm always progressing. And again I say, this includes issues of the dunya and includes issues of the deen. For how many people feel that as every single year goes, I become closer to my Lord? How many people feel that my salah as every year goes becomes better? I see myself to be a better person. Some of us were like a circle. They start well, they go back to where they uh, began from. Others, you can't even describe the shape of their trajectory. One day like this, one day like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the mu'min is like this tree, always improving, always becoming better. And I give you one example. There are many examples of this in our life. Where if I was to ponder and reflect, I find myself to be the opposite. When a person is young and they have energy, they feel close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person gets married, starts uh, to have a family, busy with work, they see the complete opposite. So your family and your work was an excuse for you to go in the opposite direction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you're always progressing. That is the quality of a mu'min. Let me give you one example that is relevant to us. A person when they're younger, before they get married, مثلاً, the way in which they serve their parents. Everyone knows ita'a of your parents, obedience to your parents. The secret to your success in this world is this. And I don't want to enter into that. But the secret to a person's success in whatever they do is they serve their parents in the best way. Before I get married, before I have a family, before I get busy, I serve them. Instead of becoming better year by year, as the years increase and a person gets married and then they have children, I'm too busy. My marriage and my children and my family become an excuse. I'm unable to serve them in the same way. This is only one example. Examples are many. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the branches reach the sky. There was also a third meaning. 
of what that means in regards to the mu'min and the believer that the branches of this tree reach the sky. Mufassireen say that when branches are close to the earth and to the earth, one thing happens. You have a tree, you have a plant close to the earth. Naturally, the dirt of the earth, the insects of the earth will contaminate and make the leaves and the tree impure. But when the branches are right out of the top, nothing can reach that. The dirt that is on the bottom of the earth cannot reach the branches that are at the top. So what does this relate to the mu'min? The mu'min also has one very interesting quality. These small petty things that happen in their life don't affect them. Because the branches are at the sky, not at the bottom. How many times have I seen a small issue makes a person react? When a person reacts as a, at a small issue, they don't have a quality of a mu'min. Let me give you an example. To take this point further, imagine that I came somewhere to recite a majlis. I entered, it's the first time I've gone there. Just before I'm going up to sit on the member, they announced my name wrong. They said another name. So they announced my name and I'm not getting up. This hasn't happened, it's an example. I'm not getting up. So the organizers came and said, why don't you go on the member? So I said, uh, the reason I don't go is because they've got my name wrong. I'm not happy. I'm not going to go on the member. So if all of you had seen this, what would you think? You'd think this person is better than that. Why? Because he's got a turban on his head. This person uh, claims to be a person of knowledge. A person of knowledge is better than reacting to small things like this. Oh, I came and the measure started one hour later. By mistake, sometimes issues happen. Sometimes people make mistakes. I said, I'm not going to forgive them. I'm not going to read today. Your first reaction would be what? We expect better from that person. Why? Because he claims to be a person of knowledge. In the way that you expect better from a person of knowledge in small things like this, Allah expects better from all believers. That when these small things happen in your life, don't react. When a person said salam to someone next to me but didn't say salam to me, and straight away I'm upset. When a person didn't invite me to a certain thing and I hold, hold it in my heart, there's a difference to being taken advantage of and to not reacting to petty things. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the branches of that tree are right at the top. How many issues between families, between siblings, between husband and wife happen due to this same idea of reaction? And so these are some of the meanings and interpretations that we had of far'uha fissama. The verse goes on. The third quality of the tree and the quality of the believer, Allah says, tu'ti ukulaha. This tree is of a certain type. For certain trees you find have leaves but no fruit. Certain trees are also fruit bearing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this tree, that which is the tree of your belief and iman is fruit bearing. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the third quality of the mu'min is that he doesn't just take or she doesn't just take from those around. They also give to those around them. The, fr the tree is fruit bearing, it has fruit for a person to eat. And I'll give you this example. To explain what the verse is saying. A few months ago, I was sitting with one of the scholars and he told me this incident that happened with his father. His father was a great uh, scholar but was made shaheed by Saddam. He says, I came to my father when I was very young and I wanted a book that my father had in his library. I asked for this book. So uh, my father said, take it, read it. Once you're finished, give it back to me. So I didn't want that. I didn't want to borrow the book. I wanted to take the book for myself. So I started saying things. I started making excuses. He said, take the book, read it. Once you're finished, give it back to me. I said, no, you know, when I read a book, I write on it. I annotate. So I don't want to ruin your book. Give it to me. If it's my possession, I can freely annotate. So the father says, no. Take it and give it, write on it, give it back to me. He says, you know, when I read a book, I bend it. Sometimes I bend the covers this way and that way. So I don't want to ruin it. If it's mine, I can do what I want. He says, no, take it, give it back to me. He says, I did this three or four times until eventually I said, what's going on here? Can't you give me one book? He said, it's not because I'm cheap. 
And I don't want to give you, give you the ownership of the book. I'm trying to teach you something. He says, what? He says, I'm trying to teach you don't always have this instinct that often is part of human nature that you have to own things. The human being loves to take, loves to have milkiya and ownership of. It becomes second nature. And often I give this example. Sometimes something is being given out for free. Someone says this is for free. Whoever wants to take it can take it. Whether I know what it is or not, whether I need it or not, people will go and take it. Why? Because we have the habit of taking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the tree, yes, it takes from what is in the ground, but the quality of that tree is it tu'ti wa kulaha. It gives that which it has. The mu'min gives that which it has to those around. In the way that the tree gives shadow to those that wish to take shadow underneath it, the way that it gives fruit to whoever comes, this is the quality of a mu'min. In a society, there's a request if the brothers can move forward, and I'm assuming also the sisters if there is space. Rahimallahu man dhakar al-qa'im min al-Muhammad. Second salawat for love of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Third in love of Fatima al Zahra salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Your fourth salawat for Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. <coughs> Your fifth salawat for Safir al Hussein Muslim ibn Aqil. In a society where a person often is selfish, I wish to take from people, I don't wish to give them that which I have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is the quality of a mu'min. And what is interesting is that which is mentioned is that the tree gives fruits. For this is in line with a riwayah from the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salla ala. Where the Prophet of Islam makes it, describes the believer and he says the believer is like the bee. Why ya Rasulullah, why is the believer like the bee? He says because the bee, its nutrition is that which is pure from the plants and the flowers. But what it gives is that which is sweet. The believer, it's the believers dealing with those around him or her is always something pleasant. And the way that this tree is always giving fruits for those to eat. I'll give you one example before I come to the fourth. In the sh uh, shrine of Sayyidina Ma'asuma alayhi salatu wasalam is a scholar in Qom buried by the name of Sayyid Muhammad Taqi Khunsari. Sayyid Muhammad Taqi studied in Najaf al-Ashraf with some of the biggest scholars in recent times. And then he moved after his studies to Qum. And Qum he taught for a number of years and a lot of his students are very well known. And he was known for his piety, for his taqwa, his knowledge but his piety. Those that have spoken about the history of scholars have mentioned this incident. That there is a drought in the city of Qum. When there is a drought there is a number of things that can be done. And there's a number of things that a believer can do. Of those is the recommendation of Salatul Istisqa. Salatul istisqa is the salah done asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for rain. There are certain etiquettes of this salah, how to perform it, the recommended acts. And there are a few times in history where it's taken place. On a big scale, people have done salatul istisqa. So in Qum, there's no rain, there's a drought. They want to perform salatul istisqa. Of the recommendations of the person that performs salatul istisqa is an alim as well as someone very pious and so they chose Sayyid Muhammad Taqi perform Salatul Istisqa inshallah it rains there are other recommendations of this Salah for example the elderly should come and uh, attend the Salah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has respect for the white beard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the dua of the elderly likewise the children are recommended to attend Salatul Istisqa because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the prayer of children a time is set Sayyid Muhammad Taqi is going to come and perform Salatul Istisqa. Two other scholars contact him. They say, we also wish to attend with you during this Salah. Can we attend? So what would be your answer? 
Can we attend to pray for a rainfall? There's a drought. Of course. He says, no. What did I say? That tree gives shelter to those that want. That which the tree gives is always sweet. A mu'min, look at how the mu'min thinks. The tree sacrifices what it has and gives to others. Instead of the person always taking from those around them, the believer gives. He says, no, you can't attend that salah. They said, why? He says, because look, if I'm on my own and I pray salah to istisqa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the prayer and rain pours down on this city, this will increase the status and honor of all scholars. No one will think it's just me. They'll think a scholar read it and everyone shall be honored that alhamdulillah the scholars are still pious. So if I read Salatul Istisqa and rain falls, all of you shall remain honored. If you, all three of you, or two of you and all three of us, all of us came and prayed and there wasn't rain in the way that I shall be humiliated. Now look, he prayed. He's not pious enough for Allah to make rain fall. Both of you shall also be humiliated. Don't come. He says, if I'm on my own and there is rain, all of us will be respected. If I'm on my own and there's no rain, the only one who shall be humiliated is me. In other words, to protect the honor of other people, other believers, he told them, don't come. I will sacrifice my honor in front of these people. The third quality, tu'ti ukulaha. The fourth. And final quality of this tree, which is the believer and the mu'min, kullahin. There are certain trees that give fruit and are fruit bearing for certain periods of time. This tree, for example, two months in the uh, year, this is the season for that fruit. Another three months, another four months. Allah describes this tree and says, no matter what time of the year you come, it's always fruit bearing. He says, this is the example of the mu'min. Meaning what? Meaning no matter what time and what situation a person seeks help from a believing man or woman, they are always ready to give help to another person. The quality of a believer is their help is not restricted. And you find a number of narrations in this regard. For example, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam in a narration, he says, if a mu'min comes to me asking for a hajj, a mu'min comes to me asking for a certain thing. I rush to answer that person's haja and request. They said, why ibn Rasulillah? And think about it. Often, we're the opposite. Someone asks me for a loan. I'll delay it and delay it and delay it until I have to give it. Why? What's my thinking? If I delay it by one week, maybe by that time he doesn't need the money anymore. Maybe by that time he'll find someone else to give him that money. Our thinking is like this. The imam's thinking is the complete opposite. When someone asks me for something, I delay it. So maybe they find someone else. Maybe there's another solution to their problem. The holy imam says, when someone asks me for a certain thing and a certain haja, I rush to answer it. They said, why, ya ibn Rasulillah? He says, out of fear that if I delay, by the time I reach them, they no longer have that haja and thing that they require. He says, this tree, any moment you come, it's ready to give. The fruit that it has, this is the example of a mu'min. And Imam al-Kadhim gives us a clear criteria for this. Have you ever asked yourself a question? When I perform an action that is seen as an action of good, an action of goodness in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what are the criteria for that action? Amalun hasan, amalun salih. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the criteria for such an action? The Imam says three things. If you have three things in, these action, in your action, it is classified as a good action. He says, number one, you don't take that which you have performed to be big. Meaning what? Meaning the action itself is great in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way in which I have performed it, I take it to be small. Holding a majlis is an action great in the eyes of Allah azza wa jal. But when I held the majlis, in my heart, what should I have? That I have done nothing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have many shortcomings when it comes to this. I, for example, recite a majlis. I come off the member. In my heart should be, I didn't adhere to the haq of that majlis. What I have performed is small in my eyes. Not that I come off very impressed with myself. That I have done a great job. Number two. He says, number two, the action which is done without anyone knowing. Today first, before performing the action, 
I'll post five things about it, then I perform the action. The culture is this. I have to show people that I have done it. It's easy for me to take a photo and share it to show people I've done the action. He says the second quality, no one knows about the action that you have done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says the third, the third is this, kullahin. The third is that the action is done immediately when a person requires that which I am performing. And so the fourth quality is that this tree is fruit bearing at all times. If these four qualities have been understood, I said the perfect example of this tree which shows us the life of the mu'min, the perfect example of this tree are Ahlul Bayt And so my final question is how is it that Sayyid al-Shuhada sallamullahi alayhi showed us these four qualities in his life? For if you look at the life of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, very clearly you find each of these qualities. The first was what? Asluha thabit. Istiqama and uh, strong faith, nothing can change that faith. What better example of that is Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. For often, when I'm about to perform something, especially if the task is difficult, if I have everyone around me encouraging me to perform it, it becomes easier. A person has a difficult task, everyone is encouraging them to perform that action, it becomes easier. But when I am performing something and everyone is telling me not to do it, how difficult does that task become? This is the situation of Hussein alayhi salam. For when he leaves Medina, how many people told him? Whether it's Abdullah ibn Ja'far, whether it's Ibn Abbas, whether it's Muhammad Hanafiya, Ya ibn Rasulillah, don't go. But you don't find even one hesitation in the heart of Hussein alayhi salam. When he knows that I'm to take my family members, when a person has a six-month-year-old child, how careful are you over that child? But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked for this, I don't think twice. Asluha thabit, far'uha sama. The branches of this tree reach the sky. These people have the loftiest of status. I don't need to tell you about the status of Sayyidu shuhada And I said that mu'min has the highest of goals. What is higher than the goal of preserving the religion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam? Tu'ti ukulaha. It's always fruit bearing. Read the history of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. And you'll see what sweetness people gained from Aba Abdullah al Hussein. For we're told on his way towards Kufa before the caravan is stopped, Sayyid al Shuhada passes by alayhi salam, passes by a watering source. He tells his family members, his companions, quench your thirst, quench the thirst of your animals, and then collect water. Those that have written in the books of maqatil of what took place, they said Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam makes them collect a lot of water. More than what would be required. You can calculate it. If there's 72, if there's 100 people, you can calculate how much water each would require eventually. He carries much more. And to carry that amount of water is something difficult, it's heavy. Until he reaches a place when he stopped by Hurb bin Yazid al-Riyahi. When he stopped by Hurb bin Yazid al-Riyahi, the books of history say that the people that are with Hur are very thirsty. And so immediately Hussein Salamullah Ali says, tell them to quench their thirst from this water. And the scholars then say, now we realized why he collected so much water. Because with the ilm that he has from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knew that this would happen. And so Hussein wishes to quench the thirst of people that may have been the ones that shot an arrow at his own heart. Or may have been the ones that shot an arrow at the heart of Ali al Akbar. Tu'ti ukulaha. And when this happens, there's one person that the books of Maqtal speak about. He's shaking, he's shivering, he's so tired. There's extreme heat. Someone gives him some water. He tries to drink it. He shakes. The water falls on the ground. They send water to him a second time. The same thing happens. This happens a third time. When it happens a third time, the books of Maqtal say there is someone who is sitting near him. That person stands up, comes to him with his own hands, quenches that person uh, with his thirst and gives him water. That person drinks from the hands of this individual. That individual goes back and sits down. 
This person who's from the army of Horeb and Yazid says, who is this person that has just quenched my thirst? They looked at him and said, you don't know him? That's Hussein ibn Ali, alayhi salam. That is the one that you're trying to stop, that his own killers, he quenches their thirst with his own hands. I said the fourth quality, kullaheen. Every moment this tree has fruit, every moment Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam guides people. Every moment is there. We're told that in his last moments, when people were hesitant to separate the holy head from his body, after he's fallen on the ground, people are hesitant. We can't take the life of Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. So the books of Maqtal say one person comes up to say the shuhada trying to perform this atrocious crime and he runs away. And you know what he says? Even at this moment, look at the fruit bearing tree. He runs away saying, how can I cut his head? When just as I was about to strike, Hussein looks at me and says, have you prayed your salah today? Even in that moment, say the shuhada is reminding someone about the prayer of God. And one of those examples, even in the most difficult times, the service he gave to people around him, is that Sayyid al-Shuhada, as he's leaving Medina, bumps into Farazdaq, the poet. It's well known. When he bumps into Farazdaq, Farazdaq asks him a certain fiqhi question. If you have a tragedy taking place, if you have some sort of difficulty, would you answer a fiqhi question? Would you take time? You're about to leave with your family and children. Your life is in danger. But as the verse says, at every moment, kullaheen, even at that moment, Hussein answers the fiqhi questions that Farazdaq has before leaving and changing his hajj into Umrah Mufradah. And it's there that Farazdaq has a very famous line. For Hussein says, you have come from Kufa. What is the situation of the people of Kufa? He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, shall I tell you the truth? He says, tell me nothing but the truth. So then he says that famous line that قلوبهم معك سيوفهم عليك Their hearts are with you, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. Their swords are against you. And this was a reality that Muslim Ibn Aqil realized as he entered into Kufa. For Muslim has a role and a job that he is given by Aba Abdullah al Hussein salam Allah alayhi enter into Kufa. The thousands of letters that have been written, see how much support there is. And as we know, there are those that wrote letters to Sayyid al-Shuhada and they were sincere in their letters. There were those that wrote letters to Sayyid al-Shuhada thinking what? Thinking a battle will take place between Hussein and Yazid. There's going to be wealth involved, war booty. Whoever is victorious will go to that side and take what they have. And so Muslim ibn Aqil enters into Kufa. I often say, there is no tragedy like the tragedy of Sayyid al-Shuhada, but there are certain similarities between what a Muslim goes through and what takes place with Imam al Hussein on the 10th of Muharram. Muslim goes. There is a curfew in Kufa. People are unable to leave their houses. He enters in the masjid. He begins to pray Salatul Maghrib, Jama'atan. And as he's praying congregational Salah, by the time of Salatul Isha, he looks behind him. The hundreds of people that were there leave Muslim ibn Aqil alone. And so he wanders the streets. And there is a warrant, arrest warrant for Muslim ibn Aqil. He wanders the streets. He's thirsty. In the way that his master shall be thirsty on the 10th of Muharram. Wandering the streets of Kufa, he stands outside of a house. He has nowhere to go. When you've heard the woman by the name of Taw'a, she comes out. She says, oh man, individual, why do you stand on my doorstep? Where have you come from? To which he replies, Ana min Medina Rasul. I come from Medina. Taw'a hears the name Medina. Medina of Ahlul Bayt, Medina of the Prophet. She says, you have come from the Medina of my master. Muslim says, not only have I come from the Medina of your master, I'm from the family of your master. She realizes this is Muslim. She quenches his thirst and he enters into the house. 
ونعم السفير in the way that Hussein and his companions spent their last night in ibadah and worship. Tawa says, I gave Muslim a room in my house, and all I can hear during the night is tahleelun wa tazkirun wa tasbih. Muslim does the of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa lahu dawiyun. Until the son of Tawa returns home, he sees my mother is entering into this room and exiting. He asks her, Who have you placed in this room? Tawa tries to avoid the question until the son of Tawa realizes Muslim is in our house. He goes and tells the people of obeyed Allah ibn Ziyad and then when the daytime comes after spending his night in ibadah and worship Muslim hears that the soldiers are outside of the house he comes out of the house of Tawa I ask him O oh Muslim stay in the house wait for them to enter. Maybe he would say this is the house of a notable woman. This is the house of a respectable woman. If I stay in the house, they will break into her house. And so it is better that I leave by myself. I say Muslim so much respect for the house and the door of Tawa. Three days after the death of Rasulullah, a companion says, I saw smoke coming from the house of Zahra. I asked, why are they cooking in this house? For when a person dies after a number of days, you shouldn't cook in that house and turn on the stove or cook up. People should give you food. He says, why are they cooking in that house we should send them food he says I came to the house of Fatima I saw no one is cooking in this house rather سأحرق الدار ومن فيها I saw Zahra بين الباب والجدار they kick the door on to Fatima Asaruha Bain al-Babi wal-Jidar The nail pierces the chest of the and Zahra would call out, Fadha ilayki khudini. Fadha muhzin has left this world. So much respect for the house of Tawa. What was the respect for the house of Fatima to Zahra? Muslim says, I came out of the house and I fought a number of people. For he is from the family of Amir al mumini until Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad sends more soldiers they dig a trench and cover it until Muslim at one time falls into the trench his teeth are broken his face is bruised they take him to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad at the top of Darul Amara they say do you have any life requires he says I have three number one I have loans and debts pay off my debts he says number two I am thirsty the third request I have tell my master 
ابا عبد الله دو نوت كم تكون في ابن زياد says i grant you the first and the second but not the third they give him a glass of water every time he tries to drink blood enters into the glass allah wishes for him to die thirsty like his master aba abdullah until they cut his head they throw his body from dar al amair i say muslim they separated your head but when your body lay on the ground no one trampled your body When Hussein's body lies on the ground the horsemen trample the body of Hussein until third or fourth muharram comes hussein has reached karbala and he sees messengers coming from kufa he asks them what is the news of muslim ibn aqil they say a'zam allah lak al ayyajr imam al hussein begins to cry what does sayyid al shuhada do next he comes to zainab he He says where is the young daughter of muslim where is hamida zainab begins to bring hamida hussein says don't bring her like this how should i bring her he says wash her face put earrings on her ears Hamida comes and sits on the lap of Hussein Hussein places his hand on her head Hamida says have I become an orphan Hussein says why do you say this she says today it feels like the hand of Hussein is on the head of an orphan he says yes muslim has left this world now your father is aba abdullah they say who would have been watching this the daughter of Hussein when someone's father dies they are even hearing someone washes their face someone places their hand on their head shimar says i came late to loot the camp i saw everything has been taken i see a young girl running right to left i tell her give me your earrings ruqayya is a about to take off the earrings he says i ripped those earrings from her ala la'natullah على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلم ينقلبون النا لله وإنا إليه راجعون إلهي بالحسين الوجيه وجده وأبيه وأمه وأخي والتسعة المأسومين من ذريته وبني اغفر لأوليائنا وكف عنا أعداءنا واشغلهم عن أذانا وأذهر كلمة الحق واجعلها العليا وأجهد كلمة الباطل واجعلها السفلى إنك على كل شيء قدير He has a request to recite Dua or Shifa for Haj Abdul Rauf Sharifi who is unwell and all of those that are suffering and unwell. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Amma yujibu al-muthar idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su'u 
أمي جيبوا المصر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمي جيبوا المصر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمي جيبوا المصر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن فجيبوا المفطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء صل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين